Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is going to look at whether two climbers wearing hobnail boots and fishnet stockings were able to zigzag their way up the north side of Everest years before the Chinese. But I'm not talking about Mallory and Irvin. This video is going to look at Hornbein and Unsold's 1963 climb. Although the Hornbein Unsold route is commonly called the West Ridge route, that is primarily because that was the route they had permission to climb. What they actually climbed is squarely on the north face, which had recently been annexed by the Chinese. And while their original intent was to climb the West Ridge route, it quickly became apparent that the West Ridge was not possible, and they traversed over to what they had already named the Hornbein Couloir and climbed up the Couloir onto the final Summit Pyramid. For regular visitors to this channel, Hornbein and Unsold's 1963 climb is a near mirror of routes taken by the early British expeditions. But in this video, when I refer to the Ridge Route, I am referring to the West Ridge, and the Couloir is the Hornbein Couloir, not the Norton Couloir. Hornbein and Unsold's climb is one of the great climbs of Everest, and just recently, Tom Hornbein passed away. Although Hornbein was an experienced climber in Colorado, he was not a professional mountain climber. Just beginning his career in medicine as an anesthesiologist, the 1963 summit was his first and last trip to any 8,000 meter peak, though he did continue to climb around the world on smaller peaks. The 1963 climb also marks the end of the gentleman climber era for the great climbs. While there would be more great climbers on Everest, Mesner, McCartney Snapes, Boardman and Tasker, all of those were professional mountain climbers. The American 1963 expedition, much like the early British expeditions, had a decidedly scientific purpose and was full of highly educated individuals with three medical doctors and six PhDs, including Willie Unsold, who had a PhD in philosophy and had taught religion and ethics at Oregon State. Nor was the climber's expertise merely academic. Hornbein designed the oxygen mask himself based on feedback from other climbers complaining about the inability to breathe with the mask on. The masks were manufactured by Fred Maytag, though likely you are, you are more familiar with Maytag from the washing machines his grandfather's company made. His grandfather had long since passed away, and Fred Maytag II was now running the company. Maytag had the research division make the mold according to Hornbein's specification, which dramatically reduced the number of valves and made it easy to de-ice. The masks were known on the expedition as the Maytag mask, though Fred Maytag himself was not part of the expedition. In his book, Everest, The West Ridge, Hornbein describes how their summit day started at 4 a.m. when the oxygen they were sleeping on ran out, waking them up. They started to get dressed, a process that would end up taking two hours. The clothing consisted primarily of wool layers, but also included some duofold underwear, a blend of cotton and wool fabric, which sometimes has nylon or polyester, but it is not clear the exact composition of their duofold. If anyone knows the exact composition of that particular duofold, please leave a comment. They also had a windproof outer shell that appears to have been synthetic. More curious is the description of a type of fishnet underwear. It apparently worked well by providing a layer of insulating air right next to the skin. Hornbein also notes that they brought down parkas, but says, in spite of the cold, our down parkas would be too bulky for difficult climbing, so we used them to insulate two quarts of hot lemonade, hoping they would remain unfrozen long enough to drink during the climb. Much like Tenzing Norgay, they use reindeer skin boots with felt liners and heavy wool socks. I'll return to the boots a little later. Hornbein describes how on May 22nd, they set out at 6.50 a.m. from high camp at 27,250 feet, carrying 40-pound loads primarily made up of the oxygen equipment. They climbed roped up with Unsold generally leading, and Hornbein would tug on the rope if he needed to get Unsold's attention. They had already determined the ridge route was not possible and had traversed over into the couloir. Their summit day started with them heading up the Hornbein Couloir, which they had taken to calling the Hornbein Couloir on account that that was the route that Hornbein advocated, as opposed to the ridge route favored by others on the expedition. Hornbein describes how they climbed the Couloir by zigzagging back and forth. The snow was not firm enough to climb with crampons alone, so they had to cut steps with their ice axes, with one climber belaying with an ice axe while the other climber plodded ahead. The routine was to turn your oxygen off while on belay, place the ice axe in the snow to hold the rope, and let the other climber cut the steps. After climbing up a rope's length, the rolls would reverse. Once out of the couloir, they began to head back towards the west ridge, though they had considered heading over to the northeast ridge as well. 
Approaching the west ridge, they encountered a large rock obstacle, and Hornbine describes how they took their crampons and overboots off so they could use the cleated rubber soles of their regular climbing boots. Of course, regular visitors to this channel know these as hobnail boots. They would not meet back up with the actual west ridge until about 28,600 feet, and it was only the last couple hundred feet of the west ridge route that was actually on the west ridge. Their route diagram shows them traversing more onto the west face, but this photo of Hornbein clearly shows he was on the west ridge. The route drawing also has a couple other simplifications, and the route I have put together for this video more closely matches the written descriptions and photographs. But looking at that photo, the final part of the west ridge was not a cakewalk either, and it would have been much easier to traverse over and finish on the northeast ridge as Messner would do 17 years later. You would definitely want hobnail boots for that section. After a total of 11 hours and 25 minutes of climbing, they reached the summit for a vertical ascent rate of 156 vertical feet per hour. Upon reaching the summit, they found the United States flag placed there by Jim Whitaker earlier that month. With fading light, they realized that there was no way they could descend the difficult route they had just climbed, and so they decided to descend the southeast ridge route. For the summit time of 6.15 p.m., their problems had only begun. By 7.30, it was dark, and although they had brought flash flashlights, with the cold, their batteries died in short time, and they were faced with the worst decision you ever have to make on Everest, whether to bivouac. They met up with two other members of the expedition who had summited via the southeast ridge route and would be able to guide them back into camp, but both of those members were also exhausted. In his pack, Hornbein had brought a camera, a radio, flashlight, and various mementos. However, the one thing he forgot to bring was a copy of the thoughts of Chairman Mao. Although the Chinese claim in 1960 to have been able to descend from the summit entirely at night with no moon, much like in 1960, there was no moon. With dead flashlights, no moon, and no copy of Mao's book, they could not descend. At that point, they took out the down parkas, the lemonade had long since frozen, put on the down parkas, and found a pocket of snow to curl up in together to wait for the dawn. Hornbein writes, Yet for me, survival was hardly a conscious thought. Nothing to plan, nothing to push for, nothing to do but shiver and wait for the sun to rise. I floated in a dreamlike eternity, devoid of plans, fears, regrets. Of course, the sun did rise, and the four headed down the mountain. Of the four climbers in the bivouac, Bishop would lose all his toes and two fingertips. Unsold, who was later evacuated by helicopter, would have nine toes amputated. While Hornbein did not have anything amputated, it is clear he was psychologically damaged by the incident, and he spent several pages ruminating about what the climb meant to him. Looking at the climb, it does not take much to see why this climb makes it on so many great climbs list. But beyond the aesthetics of the climb, there's a lot of useful analysis as the climbing equipment and style were so similar to that of the 1924 expedition. Not only was their clothes largely natural fiber, but they had made the same decisions as Mallory not to use the more bulky down clothing as it restricted movement during difficult climbing. They also had hobnail boots, which they preferred to use when climbing on the rocks. In Willie Unsold's account, published in the American Alpine Journal, he notes how much he liked climbing on the rocks without the crampons, and regretted having to put the crampons back on once they cleared the rocks. They were also climbing roped up, cutting steps, and preserving their oxygen while on belay. The only major difference between their climb and Mallory and Irvin's is that Hornbein and Unsold descended a different route, so obviously they didn't use oxygen bottle caching. However, Jim Whitaker and Gambu summited, summited on May 1st using an oxygen bottle caching scheme, just as Hillary and Tenzing had before them. But ultimately, what makes the climb a truly great climb is that they did not climb as robots. Although they set out to climb the West Ridge, when that proved too much of a problem, they simply bypassed the difficult obstacles on the ridge by taking the cool water. But even the cool water itself got too rough at one point, so they exited the cool water, climbed directly on the face, and then re-entered the cool water. Once above the couloir, they got to a steep rock section, off came the crampons, and up they went. Down parka too bulky? Don't wear it. You need to delay the other climber while they cut steps? No problem. Just turn your oxygen off, and you'll have it when you really need it. Have a difficult pitch? Mittens off, grab the rock, warm your hands when you're done. And of course they climbed roped up, with Jim Whitaker having just fallen on the descent from the summit back on May 1st, and he was only saved by the rope tied to his climbing partner, Gambu. 
Hornbein's and Unsold's climb busts just about every myth relating to early climbing on Mount Everest. But the similarities to Mallory and Irvin go beyond the natural fiber clothing, hobnail boots, and the choice of a ridge or couloir. Their climb times, descent times, amount of oxygen, weight of oxygen equipment, and the ability to deviate from a route all shed light on how real mountaineers climb a mountain. Of course, commenting on anyone's life, one must look to the inaccuracies of their Wikipedia page. Hornbein's plan was not to make a traverse. The plan for the expedition was to put Americans on the summit by any means, and as many as possible. Although Wikipedia cites Walt Unsworth's book, Everest, the Mountaineer in History, that book actually says the exact opposite of the Wikipedia page. Specifically, Unsworth notes, had all eight Americans made the summit in the first attempt from the south, likely there would have been no attempt at, at all on the West Ridge. The entire West Ridge idea was credited to, quote, the determined, argumentative, insistent little doctor from San Diego, Thomas F. Hornbein. The team largely expected to just perform a reconnaissance of the West Ridge and take enough pictures to perhaps complete the climb in a later year. The idea of doing a traverse was thir first thought of as part of that reconnaissance effort. That is, climbers would reach the summit from the south and then descend via the West Ridge to get an extremely accurate view of how it might be climbed later. However, without camps high enough, such a descent would not be feasible, so it was thought an actual attempt on the West Ridge was a safer option. The final decision to make the traverse to the south only came after Hornbein and Onsel climbed several difficult sections which could not be safely downclimbed without leaving a rope. As they only had the single rope they were climbing with, the traverse was done because it was, it was the only way they were getting down the mountain safely. They also did not start their final descent until sometime after 5 a.m., with the 4 a.m. time just being noted as the time the sky started to brighten. But accuracy was never Wikipedia's strong suit. Nor were they met by climbers with extra oxygen bottles. Although climbers had headed up from South Coal to look for what they believed would be dead bodies, the added fact of extra oxygen bottles does not appear in any of the various accounts and appears to be fabricated from thin air. As with everything on Everest, nothing is what it seems. The climb on the West Ridge did not actually climb the West Ridge, and as political as the American 1963 expedition was, the lasting legacy of the climb remains more political than any other climb as it puts the Americans as the first summiters from the North who lived to tell the tale all 12 years before the Chinese would reach the actual summit of their own mountain. Sixty years after Hornbein and Unsold plotted up the North Face, the legacy of their climb is still visible in the great extent the Chinese go to prop up the 1960 expedition as being a success. But until China releases the summit rocks allegedly collected from the summit in 1960, credit for the first successful round trip from the North goes to Hornbein and Unsold. The Chinese themselves attempted the West Ridge in 1965, with their high point being here. But all of that is just the politics of Everest. What did the climb mean to Tom Hornbein? He doesn't exactly say in his book. He writes about some of his feelings, but ultimately I think the meaning for him is best summed up in this picture, drawn by one of his children. And that is why he never did anything like it again.